Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Marie Latulip and I'm the Director of Science Programs here at IFINS. And this is the third in our 2021 webinar series that is focused on diet and impact on the gut microbiome. So a quick note for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit scientific organization that advances food safety and nutrition science for the benefit of public health. And the way we do that is we bring together individuals from industry, government, and academia to together identify areas of common interest. And just briefly, our operating philosophy is that including diverse perspectives in discussions is fundamental to the development of credible science and science that benefits the entire food ecosystem. So before we start, just a quick note on the control panel, which you should see on your desktop. The first item to note is that you can open and close that panel by clicking on the orange arrow. Uh, the second point is that there is a question panel. So we encourage everyone to type questions throughout the course of the presentation. Those questions are only visible to us, um, not all the attendees. And then afterwards, we will have a dialogue with the presenter today and go through some of those questions. So with that, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Joseph Pierre, who is currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. As an experimental biologist and a gastrointestinal physiologist, he uses translational models to understand how gut mi microbial communities, so that includes bacteria, yeast, and fungi, influence host metabolic outcomes. And Dr. Pierre received his PhD in nutritional science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago with Dr. Eugene Chang. And there he investigated the microbiome, the mycobiome, microbiome diet interactions, as well as bile acid metabolism. So we're happy to welcome Dr. Pierre, and we will turn the platform over to you. All right. Uh, can everyone, uh, you can see my screen there, Marie? Looks perfect. All right, I'm going to turn off my video. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be with you. Um, my, this is my first time uh, participating in this organization. Um, my background, as mentioned, is in uh, nutritional science, and so uh, I feel like I'm among friends here. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to be talking about um, fungi and their role in the microbiome, which is <clears throat> a relatively new area of microbiome research as a whole. Uh, so how do I advance? My disclosures uh, are a connection with a, a startup company in Chicago. So we're located um, at the University of Tennessee's Health Science Center in Memphis, uh, over on the very far western part of the state. Um, and my laboratory uh, was established in 2017. Um, we use um, various translational models to get after gut physiology, uh, intestinal host microbiome interactions, uh, surgical nutrition models, uh, and exploring the microbial communities within the gut, um, isolating members through aerobic or anaerobic culturing, um, and, and the use of germ-free sterile animals to bring back microbes and study causality. We work closely with our clinical collaborators in the hospital to gather samples and our bioinformaticians to put all the data together. So it's kind of an overview of my lab here. So um, <clears throat> the gut microbiome, as a lot of people with interest in the microbiome and, and those attending this seminar um, well know, um, is a symbiotic, um, mutualistic uh, relationship between the host and the microbial colonizers. Um, within the gut, those microbes um, can weigh four to five pounds. Uh, so an immense amount of mass. Um, their microbial gene content um, out, outpaces the mammalian gene content by 50, uh, 50 to 150 fold. Uh, so a huge range of genes and, and functions. Um, and these include, of course, within the gut, the breakdown of um, uh, nutrients, uh, de novo synthesis of, of vitamins and amino acids and small molecules that shape uh, the host. They educate the immune system, especially the mucosal immune system, um, to respond uh, to potential pathogens and, and um, environmental 
antigens at mucosal surfaces and systemically. And um, they, through the release of, of short-chain fatty acids and small molecules, uh, regulate cellular proliferation uh, and function throughout the body. So a lot of the research going back 15, 20 years is, is focused on bacteria, which makes sense because if you isolate DNA from, from gut fecal contents or, or other regions of the intestine, 98, 99 plus percent is going to be bacterial origin. Um, but other members um, and other domains or kingdoms exist within um, the intestine. These include archaea, uh, bacteriophages, viruses, uh, so bacteriophage being <clears throat> prokaryotic viruses, but also your um, eukaryotic viruses, fungi, protists. And the domain of fungi is quite interesting because uh, it, it is an enormous um, domain, two and a half to three and a half million estimated species. Only about 150,000 have been well described. A lot of these are plant pathogens, your molds and things. Uh, and there's over 300 human pathogens that have been identified. These are important, maybe classically with penicillin's discovery. You think about antibiotics as, as these different microbial kingdoms battle each other. They come up with strategies, uh, in this case, fungi finding ways to inhibit the growth of bacteria uh, leading to antibiotics. Obviously, they're very important in food and alcohol manufacturing and Saccharomyces strains. Um, and we're beginning to learn more about how they contribute to the complex gut ecology of, of the host. In addition to other surfaces, respiratory tract, uh, nasopharyngeal uh, spaces, the skin, etc. cetera. Uh, this uh, kind of leads to the question of when you detect these things in the body uh, and on the body, are they true colonizers? Are they supposed to be there? Um, or are they just environmental contaminants? Or if you're eating something, um, if you're eating bread and there was brewer's yeast that manufactured that, uh, is the detection of Saccharomyces, for instance, really a colonizer or is it a, a food byproduct? Um, and so this is an important thing to keep in mind as uh, we're learning more about the microbiome, uh, what's really there, what can really thrive versus what is passing through. Uh, yesterday on BBC, there was a, an article about this 120 year old ship that wrecked and they were, they, the hull of the ship was filled with beer and a lot of it was still intact and so, um, this interesting article, you can, you can uh, take a quick browse on, on Google and find it. Um, various scientists are, are trying to see if they can revive these yeast strains and revive different flavors of beer. Um, so just one illustration that many of food and nutrition uh, researchers are familiar with. So the field of microbiome, <clears throat> in contrast to microbiome, is just emerging. So you can see starting in 2005, if you go on PubMed, microbiome and gut microbiome is a keyword. Uh, began uh, its rise uh, pretty steadily now, over 10,000 publications a year that include microbiome as a keyword. And in contrast, things like the virome or the microbiome are just beginning to take off. It's important to note that this doesn't mean that many decades of, of work has not focused on fungi or yeasts, but largely those were done in the context of infectious settings uh, where a single organism uh, was studied. Uh, and so really the microbiome more so refers to uh, the more complex and entire collection of those organisms as they may be colonizing a niche, in this case, the gut. <clears throat> um, and so if, you know, if you're looking at bacteria, you, you'd use different conserved regions of DNA. Uh, bacteria often is 16S. So for fungi, uh, there's an internal transcribed um, a spacer. Uh, ITS or um, ITS or 18S that's used, very similar to uh, 16S where you can generate amplicons and assign membership. Uh, other approaches might be shotgun um, metagenomic sequencing where the entirety of the DNA can be isolated, sequenced, and reconstructed in capturing, in this case, fungi, bacteria, archaea, and virus. Um, so just a quick overview. Uh, eukaryotic cells don't have the 16S, and, and so it's well conserved. You have these variable and hyper, uh, these hyper variable regions and conserved regions, and you can take advantage of this. So the same kind of thing happens uh, in fungi. Uh, with the internal transcribed spacer in the 18S uh, regions, there's conserved and variable regions that are used uh, to identify um, different taxonomy 
uh, in a sample. There's challenges to this, of course. Fungi have thicker walls than bacteria. They're, they're um, compositionally uh, different and sometimes more challenging to break up. So when you're trying to investigate a microbiome versus a um, microbiome, uh, there's a little bit, uh, optimi the optimization techniques differ with the mechanical disruption and enzymatic strategies needed to break open those walls. The databases are about 10 years behind the bacterial databases, so um, curating as many uh, environmental and, and human and animal associated uh, fungi as possible, uh, that's still catching up so that when we get these sequences we can assign them to something. And then there's also um, a taxonomic classification problem. So unlike bacteria, fungi have both a sexual and asexual life cycle. And uh, in the databases, there's quite a bit of confusion where the same species may be in a different life cycle and gets a completely different taxonomic assignment. Uh, and so those things are being worked out. Uh, and this is one of the remaining challenges uh, to fully investigating the microbiome. Um, but we do know that similar to the microbiome, um, it appears that the microbiome uh, differs uh, on different parts of the body. So the skin um, is dominated by um, colonizers such as melazasia. This is a, a yeast that utilizes uh, lipids that are secreted through sebum uh, in the skin. And... Um, it can cause dermatitis in a genetically susceptible host, but this, this particular species thrives, it's slow growing, it thrives on, on um, mammalian skin. In contrast, in the oral cavity or the distal GI tract, you have this greater diversity uh, of microbes. Um, and for example, in, in the vag uh, vagina, candida may be um, a dominant colonizer in the lung. Um, you have other pr probably environmental uh, microbes that get inhaled and trapped there in our sequence. But so uh, the parallels are that the microbiome appears to be very specific in different regions of the body. Um, as you move through the GI tract specifically, uh, you think about changes in pH, uh, different um, uh, immunological secretions, IgA, mucin, antimicrobial peptides, bile acids, uh, different stages of digestion and absorption. These lead to different environmental niches for microbes to kind of latch on to, uh, proliferate and thrive. Uh, in the mouth, um, kind of similar to <clears throat> uh, the prevalence of a lot of aerobic bacteria uh, that you may have, uh, there's a pretty uh, impressive range of diversity of fungi, candida, cladosporium, aspergillus. Um, when you think about candida uh, in the esophagus, you might think of thrush uh, or, or infection. Um, in, in someone that's immunocompromised. And then um, the diversity, uh, major fungi kind of drops off until we get back to the, the distal intestine, where uh, again, Candida, Saccharomyces, Penicillium, Cladosporium uh, are present. Uh, the concept again of whether they're, they're present because they were ingested or, or if they're actually pro proliferating at 37 degrees remains to be determined for a lot of these. So conceptually, what it got microbes do for us, and maybe you've seen this in the first couple seminars in this series, these uh, microbes are, are pretty fundamental to stimulating the immune system, first and foremost, um, and then really a range. If you look at a germ-free mouse compared to a conventionalized animal that's confluent with microbes, uh, a germ-free animal has dysfunctional angiogenesis, dysfunctional bone, um, mineral density, uh, dysfunctions in the nervous system, inner connectivity and development. Um, and um, we know that these small molecules uh, as well as byproducts can shape uh, the endocrine system, fat storage. And then uh, in their role as microbes, as mentioned, you know, they synthesize uh, novel compounds, uh, vitamins, amino acids. They break down uh, pharmacologics. Uh, so the microbiome or microbiome composition may uh, alter the pharmacokinetic ranges uh, of someone's therapies. And then um, they can colonize surfaces to prevent the emergence of pathogens that are able to get there and compete for spaces. Uh, and so a huge range of, of potential functions. Um, the data suggest that fungal communities are less stable 
than bacterial communities. There is quite a bit of variability between individuals and within individuals over time in the bacterial composition, uh, and that appears to be especially true in fungal communities as well. Um, this particular study <clears throat> um, looked at individuals, eight individuals over a year, uh, and found quite a quite a range. If you're uh, looking at the phylum level, dominated by Ascomycota, uh, but then by the time you get down to the genus level, you see between patient two a complete shift in um, in the dominant genus in the samples. And part of this may be sampling, uh, but it, it's likely that the fungal communities are considerably less stable uh, than bacteria. Uh, I just wanted to show this. This is a, a paper we published a couple of years ago. Uh, over when do we first be colonized, or when you know when when are microbes first um, getting on board? Um, so I'll just quickly go through this. We we took um, 90 babies uh, from the NICU here uh, that were either preterm uh, or full term, um, and we collected meconium, which is the first pass stool after birth, within the first 48 hours. Uh, we collected this in a sterile way. Um, we sequenced it for both the microbiome uh, and the mycobiome, um, just to see what we would see. And what we found, uh, I'm sorry, this is the cohort. Um, they were matched in gender, um, uh, race, uh, obviously differences in gestational age. Um, and what we found was that, surprisingly, all of the meconium samples had a microbiome, uh, and the vast majority of them had a detectable microbiome. Um, these are samples that are considered to be sterile, uh, or they, they should not be um, robustly colonized yet. Uh, the uterus is considered sterile. The amniotic fluid is considered sterile unless there's a, an infection. So we were surprised to find this. Uh, what we what we found in the microbiome specifically was that term babies had a greater diversity of species present, uh, or at least species assignment. Uh, preterm babies had less diversity, and they were dominated by candida, which is associated with preterm birth, uh, and is one of the early colonizers of preterm babies. Uh, and the community was was completely different. Um, this gestational age was the only predictor. Uh, or discriminator of community structure, the baby's gender, um, mother antibiotics, mother's age, um, route of birth did not influence the composition. It was most strongly driven by gestational age. And so we were able to do some modeling um, to look at the composition and, and with machine learning be able to say, well, is this a preterm or a full term meconium sample? Um, obviously this, this concept in this area remains very controversial. So the way that we've interpreted the presence of a meconium microbiome is that when the child is in this amniotic fluid, uh, mid kind of gestation, they begin swallowing um, and taking in any either live or dead microbial components that are here that make their way in. Uh, and really the meconium serves as a summary statement of that microbial content. <clears throat> and so whether or not they're viable bacteria, we don't know. Um, but this is just something I wanted to touch on before we move to the early life. So in the early life microbiome, kind of like um, the microbiome, there's a great uh, number of different species that will colonize the, the gut, um, shown here. And when a child is born, of course, there's a lot of environmental and genetic components that will influence what is stably colonized and, and what um, is present. So diet, whether the child is on uh, breast milk that may contain immunoglobulins uh, or oligosaccharides, um, sugars versus maybe, um, uh, what is it, um, <laughs> nutrition replacement formulas um, that may influence what is stably colonized in the gut uh, and what's present. Um, the gestational age of delivery, how ready and, and able the immune system is to handle the things that it encounters, uh, the mode of delivery where uh, maybe candida will be more uh, early on site in a vaginally delivered baby versus melasasia being a skin yeast uh, may arrive first on the scene in the, in the case of a C-section. And so all of these things can influence um, 
it is thought the early microbiome in a similar manner uh, as these environmental factors influence the microbiome. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I think we went through um, the mother's microbiome, mode of delivery, diet, uh, gestational age, whether or not the mother's been on antifungals or antibacterials. Uh, and we're learning more about what these early colonizers may mean in long-term um, health uh, of the child. Um, so when you have antibiotics, um, you knock down the bacterial colonizers, and, and this can lead to a situation where candida, for instance, can overgrow. So fungal overgrowth, in fact, one of the ways that we study um, candida in the mouse is to give antibiotics so that the mouse is susceptible to, can to candida colonization. Um, pediatric diarrheal illness is one of the global killers of children. Um, and so health outcomes here, Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces boulardii is a probiotic yeast uh, that has been shown to, to help that uh, particular uh, imbalance in the gut uh, that can be caused by a dysbiotic microbiome through overuse of antibiotics. Uh, there's emerging trends with obesity, uh, very little really still in this area, a lot of descriptive studies looking at how uh, the microbiome may sure shape that. Um, pretty interesting work by Ilyev and others looking at um, the role of uh, the microbiome on allergic responses and IBD. We'll talk a little bit about IBD. Um, and so what's, uh, what are the drivers of early colonization um, in the gut? There's a really nice paper last year, Nature Communications, um, where they used a notobiotic approach. This is our notobiotic facility where we have sterile bubbles and sterile animals and we're able to bring in uh, only select microbes, bring them into the animal, expose them, and then we can study the causal relationship between uh, a known microbe and health outcomes. And so using this approach, this particular study had germ-free animals that were devoid of microbes. They had bacteria, which was a... Um, the closed community, a closed community of 12 species or yeast, a closed community of, of five yeasts. Um, and then they put those together to have a combined community. And as expected, um, you see that 16S PCR signal is, is up in the bacteria and the bacteria and yeast. Um, 18S is up in the dual colonized. Um, and they're able to culture fungal growth in the dual colonized. And what happens is that bacteria lead to certain adaptations in cecal weight, intestinal length, here showing the colon, um, that yeast by themselves do not do. Um, in the dual group, bacteria and yeast lead to similar changes as bacteria alone. So from the standpoint of just colonizing the GI tract and causing kind of physiological responses, it appears that bacteria are pretty important for that response. On the other hand, <clears throat> when these um, investigators looked at immune responses in early life, um, they found looking at spleen populations, that bacteria, uh, so we have germ-free bacteria, yeast, dual colonized, and then dual colonized with either antibiotics or antifungals. Um, and they found that the greatest responses in CD19, CD3, POTS-P3s, uh, MHC class II, um, macrophages here, were driven by the dual colonizers. So bacteria alone, uh, yeast by themselves, uh, did not drive as strong a response as the dual uh, situation here. So it, it seems that fungi help augment the effect of that colonization on immune stimulation. And you see that if you look at the cytokines alone, IL-4, IL-6, IL-10, um, the most prominent response is driven when both bacteria and yeast are present in early life colonization. Uh, so this suggests that th these, organ these organisms um, synergize, uh, they are probably both important um, and we're beginning to understand more about what early healthy microbiome assemblage might look like. Uh, but this is some evidence to suggest that yeast play a pretty important role. And you can see <clears throat> uh, some differences across the groups uh, between IgA, uh, which is usually a mucosal specific immunoglobulin, pretty prominently driven by the dual community, uh, whereas yeast by themselves led to an augmentation of Ig1, IgG1 versus IgG3. And um, this work uh, was pretty interesting. They, they also um, did a pass at looking at uh, DSS colitis. 
So DSS is um, a chemical that causes barrier disruption in, in the hindgut, uh, generally leads to pro-inflammatory responses that's used to model uh, colitis. And um, what they found was if they gave bacteria alone, uh, spleen weight was enlarged, colon length was down, colon, colon length is usually an indicator of how much inflammation there is. So as the, um, <clears throat> the colonic wall kind of thickens and, and um, drives an immune response, often the total length of the organ will shorten. Um, so bacteria alone drove a pretty uh, pronounced uh, colitic response. Uh, you can see that if you look at um, the cytokines here, um, colony stimulating factor, interferon gamma, L6, L22, TNF-L. Uh, bacteria by themselves do that, uh, that response, uh, that pro-inflammatory response was not seen with yeast alone, um, and it was largely blunted uh, with yeast uh, and bacteria when they colonized together. Um, so this is uh, evidence that a confluent community of both bacteria and yeast memberships um, may help normalize some of the signals that were being given by the bacteria component uh, alone. And so building on, on this, uh, it's clear that you know, yeasts uh, have the ability to influence immune responses in some way. Um, and so fungal recognition in the body, um, you're probably familiar with toll-like receptors, you know, TLR4 or TLR9, uh, when you think about bacteria and, and LPS and endotoxin. Um, and so some of these toll-like receptors do recognize fungi as well. But fungi also have these uh, C-type lectins uh, and other mannose receptors um, a, this whole other class that are specific for recognizing um, surface proteins and glycoproteins um, on yeast and fungi. And so a lot of these signal through uh, similar pathways uh, in the nucleus leading to NF-kappa B and, and cytokine responses and, and various uh, cellular adaptations. Um, and there are unique cases where some of these receptors and some of these mediators, intracellular mediators of these receptors are dysfunctional. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna pivot now just to briefly talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, inflammatory bowel disease um, affects one and a half million Americans. It's estimated that of these existing one and a half million Americans, that they will accrue 700 billion in lifetime treatment costs. And there's really very, very few therapeutic um, treatments. Uh, once someone has an established IBD, uh, you can try to manage it, but there's really no, there's no cure. Um, and IBDs uh, are probably over 200 unique diseases, uh, different um, uh, gene variants that lead to one of two major phenotypes. So ulcerative colitis, which as it suggests, is an um, ulcerating type of disease, a thinning of the wall, loss of epithelium shown on the right. Whereas Crohn's disease can strike anywhere from the mouth uh, to the colon, and this is generally <clears throat> this generally presents as a thickening, uh, fibrosis, stenosis uh, uh, of the GI tract. So um, the incidence has been rising over the last 50 years, far outpacing any genetic uh, changes. Um, it's thought that IBD is this perfect storm of uh, microbial signals. These are some of the bacterial ones, um, but we could go ahead and add, <clears throat> as we're learning more about it, um, fungal um, components here. It generally requires genetic susceptibility um, to respond in a dysfunctional way to the presence of these microbial triggers. It can be influenced by environmental um, uh, inputs. Uh, smoking, for instance, can exacerbate Crohn's disease and paradoxically is protective against ulcerative colitis, probably through nicotinic receptors. And then uh, immune responses that, um, that drive those responses to microbial antigens and genetic uh, predisposition uh, leading to this perfect storm of IBD. Uh, and so uh, some recent work two years ago, uh, this is again by Ilya Vonderhill and Limon, um, they looked at fungal communities in IBD uh, and, and different uh, regions, um, cecum communities versus the sigmoid community and, and how they, uh, what was there. They found that Melazasia, Cladosporium, uh, maybe Oreobacidium were enriched in Crohn's disease uh, and 
some things such as fusarium uh, may be downregulated. Uh, but they went further um, by looking at um, melazazine and trying to understand this this correlation here um, uh, in these. I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Melazazine. Um, so this is a uh, yeast, as mentioned, that normally colonizes the skin. Uh, most of the strains are dependent on, on host lipids, uh, again, slow growing, and some can cause a dermatitis. Um, and so they focused in this particular study on melazazia. What they found was that the patients with um, Crohn's disease or iliocolonic Crohn's disease uh, fell into different categories. Um, <clears throat> often they presented with this CARD9 genotype. And this is not a loss of function, but rather um, augmentation of signaling. Um, so the, the um, gene variant here leads to a serine to asparagine, gene, uh, which alters, uh, alters its function. When they looked at the patients that had uh, these different mutations, they found when they looked at melazazia, uh, it was enriched in this serine to asparagine variant uh, universally. There was very, very little uh, pickia and a lot of melazazia, and then as you go back over uh, to the native genotype, it's the other, the other way around. Uh, Pickia was enriched, whereas melazazia uh, was, was down. And so this is a very clear relationship between host genetics and what is selected for um, in the gut. Um, they did a number of very elegant exper experiments that I'm not um, listing here. They used germ-free animals. Uh, they used ASF animals, that's where a known um, simple community is used, and they introduced uh, different yeasts, including melazazia. I'm jumping right to figure seven, which really is the takeaway. Uh, they found that melazazia um, by itself in a wild-type animal, that means it has functioning receptors, um, drove uh, colitis, so you see a shortening of the colon, shortening uh, disease severity index is uh, exacerbated, and there's an increase in lipocalin 2, which is a marker of epithelial inflammation. And this response was essentially blocked in CARD9. Um, they also showed <clears throat> by collecting myeloid cells and exposing them to either candida uh, or melazezia, that melazezia drove these responses probably through myeloid uh, phagocytic cell uh, activation. Um, and so this is a very interesting host microbial interaction that requires CARD9 for this immune response. And in patients that have a hyper-responsive CARD9, uh, they, they could become over-responsive uh, to certain fungal pathogens in the gut. I also want to touch on candida uh, in the search for pathogens. So in addition to melazezia, um, candida has long been kind of suspected to be a potential player um, in Crohn's disease specifically. So ulcerative colitis and, and colonic <clears throat> Crohn's disease can kind of fall into one category, but ileal Crohn's disease uh, may uh, be a completely different uh, beast here. Um, and so we have been focused on the potential role of candida. Um, this is driven by a lot of historical studies that find anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies in, in Crohn's disease uh, that associate with severity. Um, there's the Israeli soldier study that shows that uh, ASCA rises uh, in the blood up to 36 months before diagnosis with Crohn's disease. Uh, and so there's a lot of smoke that uh, uh, Saccharomyces antibodies may be uh, part of the response, uh, either a driver, a causal driver, or is just uh, true, true, unrelated and happens to be part of the immune response um, in Crohn's disease. So it's interesting because Saccharomyces uh, has many of the same surface epitopes as Candida. Uh, and so Candida by itself <clears throat> is capable of driving ASCA. And because most Saccharomyces are not really seen um, as pathogens that would colonize and infect, uh, it's thought perhaps that Candida is actually what's driving uh, the ASCA response in these individuals. So Candida uh, in the intestine, it's interesting because it's a polymorphic uh, fungi, like many fungi, um, but it is uh, its only natural reservoir is mammalian intestine, uh, the mammalian gut. It's not found <clears throat> in the environment. It exists as either a diploidal yeast, so you can see a yeast here uh, on the right in the scanning electron microscopy image, 
And then they send out these projections, these um, filamentous, uh, uh, hyphal uh, filamentous ropes. And these are important because they express uh, attachment proteins. Um, they secrete proteinases that degrade the cells that they're attaching to, forming biofilms on. Um, and this is considered to be the pathogenic uh, way that um, candida can colonize the mucosal surface, uh, penetrate in, into the body, and then eventually um, get into circulation and cause, and cause disease. So both of these forms, the yeast and the hyphal form, exist uh, in the gut. Um, you can see that we're just going to focus on the black bars. About 40% of candida in the stomach is hyphal, 60% are yeast that drops off in the small intestine, and then by the time you get to the large intestine, uh, there's a lot more filamentaceous uh, growth, 60%. Uh, 60, 60%. Um, <clears throat> and so these uh, these particular pathogens um, are of interest to us, and we've been examining the relationship between ileal Crohn's and, and um, uh, candida. We found um, a couple years back here that in Crohn's disease patients, if you take, if you go up into the ileum and you take a brushing um, and and plate out everything you uh, can as far as yeast, so you use a YPD plate. Uh, antibiotics in the plate, but you'll culture significantly more fungi. Um, and many of these, if you use candida selection practices, many of these are candida. Um, and so this has been reported several times. Um, Crohn's disease patients have uh, um, higher loads of fungi in the intestine. Um, we also found that if we collected biopsies from these patients and grew um, intestinal enteroids, so these are little mini guts <clears throat> that we isolate the stem cell, we can proliferate the intestine and culture, um, at least the intestinal epithelial cell. And then at the end of that, lice open those um, structures and plate them down in a monolayer. So instead of a 3D, we have a 2D monolayer. We can um, examine uh, that particular patient's epithelial response to pathogens. And so <clears throat> on the right side, you can see a healthy monolayer that was derived from a non-IBD control that's been exposed to candida. And we see very we, there, there's some hyphal growth, but very little in large uh, by and large when we went and um, quantified this with a GFP reporting um, candida. So when when they went from yeast to hyphae, we could see the GFP and quantify that in culture. Uh, the Crohn's disease patients often the yeast were hyper aggressive, uh, and so we're trying to understand what are the microbial um, signals coming from the host that may shape the behavior of these uh, organisms to become more aggressive and virulent. Um, this is an area of, of uh, forthcoming work. Um, some of the tools that we have, uh, if you <clears throat> have candida at 30 degrees, there'll be a yeast. If you heat them up, make them think they're in body temperature, um, they'll grow hyphae. Uh, and so we have some mutants where we've locked them into either yeasts or hyphae, regardless of temperature. Uh, and then we also have uh, reporter ones. So uh, based on the fluorescent channel, yeast would be red and the hyphae will be green, for instance. And this is with, uh, with a collaborator here at UTHSC, uh, Brian Peters, who's a very good um, yeast geneticist. Um, another thing that we're doing to try to get after this is collecting patient samples <clears throat> and um, looking to see what fungal organisms that we collect in feces already have generated an immune response. So the way to do this is you take out a fecal sample, you isolate out all of the fungi that exist in that sample, and then you treat that sample with an anti-IgA or an anti-IgG, uh, which will bind to coded organisms, and then we can we can sort these uh, and sequence them. So you have an IgA positive fraction, for instance, and an IgA negative uh, fraction. We can start to determine what organisms are driving immune responses and which ones aren't really seen. Um, uh, as worthy of driving an immune response. And so this is a new uh, grant that was just awarded and we're excited to work on this. Putting together the drivers of IBD, we, we kind of have this picture of uh, there is some eubiosis, which is a synergy between bacteria and yeast in the gut. Um, and then there very likely is a fungal dysbiosis. So just like you have a bacterial dysbiosis, which means a deviation from optimal function, you can have a fungal dysbiosis, which similarly in the context of IBD uh, may lead to hyper, <clears throat> hyper immune response uh, mediated potentially through genetic susceptibility in, in 
the repertoire of immune receptors in the host. Um, and so, uh, very active and promising area of research. Um, as mentioned, I Ilya of Underhill, uh, others um, are doing some really cool work in this area. So, since this is a nutrition and food, I just figured I would touch on what's known about um, the role of diet. Uh, Hoffman in 2013 published an interesting paper where he uh, and colleagues collected um, food questionnaires from a, a bunch of human subjects, and then they sequenced the microbiome, the microbiome, and archaea, and, and just kind of started to put together an early first pass of what fungi-bacterial relationships might look like under these um, different dietary intakes. One of the things they found uh, was that candida in particular, um, was upregulated by the ingestion of carbohydrate-rich diets. Uh, in contrast, um, bacteroides, a bacteria, uh, is upregulated by animal protein and amino acid intake and downregulated by, by carbohydrates. Um, so this is a neat study. It's uh, eight years old now, um, but really pioneering uh, in trying to understand inner kingdom dynamics of what's doing what. And they came up with a proposed schematic where a high carbohydrate diet uh, may feed Prevotella. Uh, Prevotella may generate sustenate. You have ruminococcus and, you, and you're generating ac acetate for these methano uh, bacterium. And candida may play a role in that by breaking down uh, simple sugars and generating acetate. Um, so this is kind of a, a theoretical schematic of the, of the ways that different players um, can synergize to, together in that community ecology and are strongly shaped by the diet that the host provides to them. <clears throat> There's also uh, recent work um, uh, from uh, Heisel here uh, up in University of Minnesota. They showed that a high fat diet or a normal diet leads to pronounced differences in community composition as shown on the left side. So break Curtis distances, beta diversity, uh, you can completely change the fungal community by a high or low fat diet, similar to the very, very well established effects of high or low fat diet on bacterial populations shown on the right. Um, so in, within the bacterial um, sequences, there's an increase in lactobacillus on the high fat diet. Uh, some allobaculum were increased, uh, whereas the standard diet was dominated by, in this case, um, S24-7. If you look at the fungi, the standard diet led to um, an abundance of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, whereas the high-fat diet led to an overgrowth of candida. Um, <clears throat> albicans, in this case, are paralipsilosis. And this was just kind of an early description on the effect of diet intake um, and really driving very strong community changes um, in, an, in a mouse model where you can control the diet. So looking at that Saccharomyces, um, there is some work to show that certain probiotic strains of Saccharomyces, in this case, Bilardi, uh, can protect against uh, metabolic syndromes. So this is a obese diabetic animal model, the DBDB mouse, um, that was put on a normal chow, and then they were either vehicle gavaged or given a Saccharomyces Bilardi uh, for, for several weeks. Um, and they found in these animals that the body weight was mildly uh, down but significant, uh, fat mass mildly down. Um, the epididymal fat, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat were also down. Um, and that the liver phenotype was a little bit more markedly improved. So smaller weight, um, a decrease in the macrophage um, <clears throat> and pro-inflammatory cell uh, MR, R, mRNA markers, and a decrease in lipid content. And the introduction of this single Saccharomyces boulardii strain also had pretty pronounced changes, uh, effects on the uh, microbiome. So looking at the bacteria, uh, if you introduce this boulardii, uh, completely shifted the community composition looking at beta diversity. Um, there was some changes in the phylum level. And you can see at the genus level, uh, at the family level over here and the genus level over here, uh, some of the shifts that occurred in response to this probiotic. Um, and so I, I just wanted to include this <clears throat> uh, kind of in the discussion of um, microbiome members and, and, um, and diet. 
So um, the question of whether fungi are shaped by diet, as was shown by Hoffman um, and Heisel, still begs the question of whether fungi can actually shape metabolism. So are they just feeding on what's there and being selected for and along for the ride, or can they shape outcomes? So this is a study we published earlier this year. It's called our vendor experiment. Uh, we, we ordered animals from four different commercial vendors, and we sequenced them at baseline. We looked at the microbiome and the microbiome. Uh, we found that the vendors um, had very different baseline microbiomes. And so we could use this natural experiment where mice came to us with different microbes on board and then feed them the same diet and look at metabolic outcomes because they were the same genotype. Um, so by and large, they should have the same genetic content but they have different microbes, and we can examine them longitudinally. Um, we found uh, that diversity on a highly processed diet, so this is just high uh, sugar content, mostly um, sucrose, uh, no fiber, led to a decrease in diversity uh, among all four of the vendor my microbiomes. Um, we found that the uh, community composition was quite distinct at baseline between vendors and shifted in response to the diet in a way that was unique. Um, and so this paper is it's in communications biology if you want to look up MIMS. Um, the upshot is that when we followed these um, mice and we looked at weight changes, adiposity with MRI, we looked at gene expression, we were able to, to create a, a composite of the metabolic phenotype and then try to draw corollaries um, in the microbiome. Um, so definitely not, not evidence of causality, um, but strong correlation that now we can take candidate species, bring them over into the notobiotic um, colony and examine them. Some of these hits were um, total adiposity appeared to be strongly driven by um, thermomyces, for instance, whereas um, other molds such as cladosporium and aspergillus um, were associated with triglyceride levels in the blood and insulin um, resistance. Um, so this is just one approach that we, we went about trying to tease apart uh, microbiome host interactions uh, with more to come uh, as we shift some of this work into uh, the notobiotic germ-free mouse facility. So the conclusions, uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit out there that I could have talked, talked about, allergy responses, um, other types of infectious settings, um, uh, but <clears throat> I just wanted to give kind of an overview as part of this seminar series of some of the emerging um, concepts specific to the gut. Um, so micro microbiome research is, is an emerg emerging component of, of the gut microbiome. Um, they uh, are now understood to have a role in shaping early life and potentially um, adult chronic disease settings and as far as immune response, uh, metabolic responses, uh, potentially uh, shaped by diet and potentially a driver of metabolic response yet to be determined. Um, and understanding these under <clears throat> these interactions of the gut microbiome in conjunction with the microbiome uh, may help us continue uh, to optimize health and treatment plans. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you, thank my, my key collaborators, at this institution and others and our funding. And I really, um, I really thank all of you for uh, listening today and, and for the invitation to be part of the seminar series.